guys uh, than to put a shovel down, putting shovels into the dirt next to each other, right? I bet you guys are all better friends after doing that little project. Yeah, either that or you're ready to hit each other with shovels. But one of the two. You probably, though, got to be, but there's going to be removing of some trees and bushes, um, some mowing, weeding, cutting wood, moving dirt. It is going to be, be a fun day of, you know, you know good, good manly things. Um, so I would encourage you, if you're coming, bring, you know, axes, chainsaws, rakes, wheelbarrows, gloves, pruners, shovels. Ask Donovan to give me a list. And when you ask Donovan to give you a list, he gives you a list. Um, I was going to say, I know there's going to be one backhoe there. If you have heavy equipment like that, check in with our deacons to see if that would be valuable to bring. I don't know if we want two backhoes. Maybe we do. But you never know. We just uh, make sure, check in with them. Uh, it's definitely more than a half a day job. I know a couple guys um, are planning on just bringing sack lunches just to keep the day going. Um, but if you can only help for an hour or two, that's great. Again, great chance to tear stuff up and build new friendships. So nothing better than tearing and building. That's, the cle that's biblical, I'm pretty sure. Um, so with that, let's pray and then get into God's word. Father, this morning we want to lift this time up before you. Uh, Lord, we know that you have something essential to speak into our lives today. Uh, Lord, as we walk through this series looking at what does it mean to be the church, to be threads woven together um, into one body, we just ask that you would open our hearts uh, to see open our minds to, to hear and to understand, um, and more importantly, help us to take the bold steps uh, to respond to what your word has to tell us this morning. So we just pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, at the, uh, at the risk of some minor uh, PTSD, I, wanna, I want you to travel back with me uh, to the summer of 2020. Um, I know. <laughs> It's not a pleasant place to visit. Um, you know, we were in, uh, I figure we were in about week 20 of the two weeks to flatten the curve. Um, you know, church was online only. Um, it was usually just Dave and I and a couple of others in here, um, you know, giving space, doing the little dance of, you know, six feet. Um, you know, I really don't miss having lights and a camera right in my face um, and having you not be there. I know there were some pastors that actually put up like little pictures of their congregation on the chairs just to, I don't have that level of, uh, you know, time. Um, but, you know, some of you put those up just so that way they could feel like there was a crowd in the room during that time. Well, during that time, um, there was a, it was a nice morning and I decided to take a walk around downtown Camas um, where we were living at the time. And, and in the distance, I saw my friend Brandon. Uh, just down there, who runs a coffee shop down there. And I waved at him and kind of walked towards him, properly trained by that point in time, 20 weeks in, to stop at the designated six feet and, uh, you know, kind of have that little bit of uh, space there. But, you know, Brandon is not as well trained as most of us. And Brandon uh, broke right into the bubble with an outstretched hand. And I remember, in the, and I, I can remember this, it was a vivid moment for me, because when that happened, older training that had been with me since I was a child kicked in, and without thinking about it, I just stuck my hand out too, because when someone sticks their hand out, that's what you do. And I just put my hand out there, and we shook hands, and we talked for a little bit. As I walked away, I noticed that I had tears in my eyes. And I remember thinking it was weird, because I don't have allergies that I know of, at least I didn't. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, walking, I'm walking away, I've got these tears in my eyes, and I'm not exceedingly happy, and I'm not exceedingly sad. And I realized in that moment, it just it dawned on me that that was my first handshake in months. It was the first time that I just had a handshake. And even though I didn't consciously recognize that that was a powerful moment, my body did. My body reacted with the emotion that I wasn't even feeling. And until I let it settle in, and I was like, oh, that, that was my first handshake since March 12th. Genesis 2.18 says this. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. Made in his image means that we were made for community. Being made in God's image means that we were made for community. You see, God has existed eternally in three persons. One God, three identities. Whole other subject matter and you, could take new classes on the Trinity at some point in time, but when we were made in his image, 
See, we were made as ones instead of threes. Whereas God is three in nature, we were one, but we were still made in his image, which means we were designed to be connected. We were designed to be in community. So because we were made in his image, but we were by ourselves, God said it's not good for him to be alone. In isolation, we are not as we were made to be. In isolation, we are not as we were made to be. See, but when, when I look at the world, not just the COVID world, but the world we live in now, the world we lived in before, 20, before March 2020, and when I look at my own life, I can't help, myself, help but ask myself, does humanity really see the need? Do I really see the need as deeply as what God ingrained in us to have? Do we look for others who have that need? Do we look and notice Brian has that need? Do we notice that? You know, if you want proof of the need, today when you get home, turn on an NFL game, um, and don't look at the field. Look up into the stands. And what you'll notice are strangers high-fiving, sharing hugs, you know, all dressed the same with paint on their face or on their, you know, bare chest, you know, if you've got a group of guys all together, you know, all painted up, you know, Packers fans, they're weird. Um, <laughs> my father-in-law is a Packers fan, and he's visiting with us this morning, so, you know, I, as yesterday, as I watched the uh, Oregon-Washington State game, um, you know, throughout that entire game, if you didn't watch it, Washington State was in control. They owned that, and the Washington State fans were so excited. Man, they were hugging and high-fiving, and man, anywhere where there was a little patch of green and yellow, those people were being you know, communally abused by the maroon and gray that was in the stands. There was this common theme, and then with three minutes left, the clock struck midnight, the coach turned back into a pumpkin, and those same people who were, consul who were you know, so excited a moment ago were now consoling each other. They found, they, that community became important for a different reason. Meanwhile, the Duck fans were seeking each other out across the field, trying to find each other so they could enjoy these, this improbable day alone. You see, we need community. We need to feel like we're a part of a connected community, especially a community that matters. You know, as we just noted, we do this with sports teams. We do this with politics. It's one of the reasons we take it so seriously. We, it's interesting, they did a study where without attaching names or the little letter in parentheses to somebody, they just wrote out things that they had said and done. And what they found is most people disagreed with all of them. The problem is, well, as soon as we add the little letter after the name, we go, that's either my tribe or it's not my tribe. And we then either get def into defense or attack mode with it. Um, we do it with fandoms, you know, growing up as a millennial, with, you know, whether it's books, Got your people who are Harry Potter people, Lord of the Rings people, Star Wars people, Star Wars before Disney, Star Wars after Disney people. You know, if we're not connected, we will find connection somewhere, even if it's meaningless and even if it's counterfeit. You know, every study that's ever been done on social media proves it isn't social. It's actually harmful to our social well-being rather than helpful. This is not a, a don't ever use it, because I do. But it's just a recognition of the reality that when social media is our social, bad things happen. See, the problem is we get the same chemical hit of social interaction when we make a post on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, but not the substance behind it. It's like you can fill up on junk food, but it's not going to satisfy. In 10, in 10 minutes, you know, you're going to need something else. You know, we see higher rates of anxiety, isolation, depression that all abound when social media becomes our primary connecting point. But the thing is, is if we have to choose between nothing and a fake something, we will always choose the fake something. You know, the, uh, there was an interesting study done on Twitter, but I, th and it was, I think it applies across the board, though, that they found that those who had the most to say on social media about a particular cause were the ones who actually did the least to actually make an impact about that cause. They said it actually came down to brain chemistry. 
is that when you make a tweet, when you say something you know, like shave the whales or something like that, as soon as you've put it out there, you get the chemical hit of having done something to accomplish, to feel you feel better about the thing. And it actually reduces the impulse to actually go make a difference. Um, the reason they found, you know, was similar, just it's this is basic chemistry. See, our bodies aren't just, we're not just emotionally wired, we're chemically wired for connection. We need one another. It is not good for us to be alone. And we'll need it so badly, we'll fake it when we don't have it. You know, it's not that loneliness was invented with Facebook. Or MySpace, I guess that was the first one. Anybody remember MySpace? The good old days. <laughs> Top eight spaces. Good times, good times. You know, social media is just the soup du jour of loneliness. It's been around for as long as we have, which is why God had to say it's not good for man to be alone. Loneliness is pervasive in our culture. We're more mobile. Families are living farther apart. We're more busy. Um, you know, and with the deep cultural and political divides that exist in our culture, we're more angry and divided than we've ever been. You know, if you're here this morning with us, there's probably something inside of you that recognizes, I need a community. That's probably part of why you're here. But despite all that, I still find myself wondering if I value it as highly as God values it. And when I look at the way that God lived in the person of Jesus, I have to say no. I don't value it the way God values it. And certainly our world does not. See, if we look at the life of Jesus, we see it clearly. You know, early in the Gospels, we see him choose out 12 who would walk with him. And out of that 12, if you notice, sometimes he calls just three away and that he invests in very intentionally, that he builds a relationship with. Um, in Matthew 8, we see a man with leprosy who comes to Jesus to be healed. And these, uh, these were untouchable people. Um, in fact, legally, they were required to stay away from others. And if they had to walk down a street where there might be other people, they had to shout out, unclean, unclean. You know, it was like an ambulance coming down with a siren to tell you to get out of the way. If, they, if you heard that unclean, it meant, oh, I need to let that guy have his space because he's not someone that I can have contact with. And yet when he comes to Jesus, this is what happens. A man with leprosy came up and knelt before him. This guy's breaking all the rules. And he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And this is Jesus' response. He says, reaching out with his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I am willing, be made clean. Yeah, I think if my eyes watered up after three months without a handshake, I wonder what it was like for a man who had, probably hadn't been touched in years to have Jesus put his hand on How much does Jesus value connection? That without hesitation, he reaches out a hand. Could go on for, for days of examples like that. John 4 is another favorite. A woman of questionable moral character comes to a well where Jesus is sitting. And in a culture where men and women aren't supposed to have deep interaction, he asks her for a glass of water, and then he turns the conversation to spiritual matters, and by the end of their conversation, she's an evangelist out in her community telling everybody they need to come and meet this guy. And even at the moment when he was hanging on the cross, Jesus was thinking about community. John 19, 26 and 27 says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, that's John that he's speaking of, he said to his mother, woman, here's your son. Then he said to, his, to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. He wasn't thinking about community for himself. He recognized what his mom's life was going to look like the next day. And he said, John, you got to take care of her. She needs connection. She needs community. He saw Mary's need, how alone she would be, and so he did something about it. So we always need to get to why. Why did Jesus act this way? And then the logical following question is, why should we? Why should we value community this highly? You know, we're, we've been talking about this idea of threads and this idea of woven is kind of our theme as we go forward. 
is that we're supposed to be woven not just into a story like we talked about last week, but woven into a community. We're supposed to be woven into a community. First reason here is that no story is a solo story. There's no story, well, except for, you know, the movie Solo. That was a solo story. But even then, there were more than one character. Han Solo isn't even solo. But I can know the, the, the one objection I can hear is what about Castaway? Castaway, that was a solo story, except it wasn't just Tom Hanks on an island. First, it establishes his love for Helen Hunt's character at the very beginning and all of his friends and coworkers. And then, you know, he, once he crashes, he saves a package to be delivered to a person. He doesn't know who that person is, but there is a person on the other end of that package that he holds on to so he can have purpose. That purpose involved doing something for a person. Even while he was there, and of course, who can forget the strong but silent Wilson? That still makes me tear up. <laughs> you know, we called this series Threads because there's something in the way that threads are distinct. They're each individual. They have different shapes, sizes, colors. But rarely does a thread meet its potential by itself. Not many threads, maybe a fishing line, that might be the one exception, but even then it has to be attached to a hook and a rod, doesn't it? In, uh, there's this piece of artwork that was put together up here, uh, which I put a picture of it up there for those who are at home and can't see it. Um, many overlapping lines that give what would otherwise be randomly placed nails in a chunk of wood some life and personality, give it a shape and a design. So if you and I are threads that God is weaving into a story, into his beautiful piece of art, it means we're going to overlap and be connected. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14 says, it says, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. See, we... Who follow Jesus have joined a common story. That means we are being woven together into a single body, different threads culturally, economically, positionally, but it's the same story now. And if we're a part of the same story, then don't we need to look at ourselves and others, especially those in the story with us, a little differently? You know, one, as we discussed last week, it's God's story, not my story. God's story, not my story. And where my story intersects and blends into God's story is where the best life begins to happen. That's where things begin to get exciting and surprising and miraculous and wild beyond our dreams and hard and difficult and everything else in between. But it becomes full. As Jesus said, I came to bring life and bring it to the full. The life that has caused men and women since 33 AD to give up their lives, their homes, their story, the story that they were writing in exchange for the story that God wants to write. One more beautiful. Number two, others are in that same story, and we get the chance to be a part of it. Everyone around you here this morning is living as a part of God's story, and you get to be a character in that story. That's pretty cool. You know, and that's actually exactly what makes the story so beautiful, isn't it? You know, that whole idea of denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following him, it means that we're mixing in with other stories. And you can't pluck one thread on that without making the other one shake. And if you pulled one out, the whole thing would come apart. Number three, when we recognize that, we can begin to recognize that everyone is somewhere in the middle of their story. There's no one in the room today who's at the end of their story, who's at the finish line of their story, completed and as God intended them to be. We're all somewhere in the middle. We're all on that journey. And so in the same way that we need grace, it means everybody else does too. It means that we can come alongside people in a place where their story is still messy because if they're walking, their story is still messy. If there's still breath in your lungs, your story is probably messy. You've had things happen to you. You've made mistakes. Mistakes have been made that have impacted you. Good things have happened that have impacted you. It's messy. 
And when we can start giving grace to one another because we recognize that we're all threads in the same story, it makes for a lot better, uh, a lot better weaving. The number four thing we can recognize is that we can't write anyone else's story. The only, the only paper we have any ability to write on is our own in this. We can't even choose how someone else is going to interact with us. We can't say, here's what you have to do to be a part of my story. They're going to be who they are. They're still the ones with the pen in their hand. It's their thread, not ours. So we're all a part of one story. No story is a solo. And number two, every character overlaps. A little bit obvious, but I think we forget sometimes that there's no decision that only impacts you. There is no decision you can make that only impacts you. If I make a decision about whether or not I go to the gas station today, I have made a decision about how long somebody else waits in line, about how much of the national oil reserves are left, about how much money Safeway makes at their pump. I think it's cheaper at Costco right now. Um, you know, all of those decisions, it may be the tiniest little thing, but we can't make a decision that doesn't impact someone somewhere even if your decision is to isolate from everyone else, even if your decision is to withdraw from other people, that's a decision that has a huge impact on other people. You pull your thread from the pattern and the whole design suffers because we've lost a string in that. Back to 1 Corinthians, Paul points out how this applies specifically in the church. He says, indeed, the body is not one part but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. And then just a couple verses later, it says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. So what do we learn here? There's, there's a whole bunch packed into those verses, but here's two things. Number one, you can't decide that you aren't needed. You can't decide that you aren't needed. Specifically in the body of Christ, let alone the rest of the world, but I would extend that out beyond that. Number two, you can't decide that someone else isn't needed either. You can't decide that you aren't needed. You can't decide that somebody else isn't needed. So let's, let's put rubber on the road here just for a minute. Let's be real. Not any, everyone in any church with more than one person is going to get along all the time, right? In any church larger than one person, honestly, even in a church of one person, I probably still wouldn't get along with me. <laughs> you spend enough time with me, you'll get it. Um, you know, in any church with more than one person, you're never going to get along with everybody all the time. And I'll go even further than that to say there are going to be people in the church you might not naturally get along with anytime. Anytime at all. It might be, you know what, that person to me, we are just not on the same wavelength. We are not the same kind of person. And here's the weird part is that God weaves those people into the same bodies all the time. It's musical. You know, but what if? What if, as I just said, God's the one who weaves. What if God does that on purpose? What if, what if God weaves those kind of things together on purpose? What if that person who's nothing but frustration was with, for you was put in this place, in this time, with you so you could grow? What if you were put in this place so someone else could grow? Because the odds are, if other people frustrate you, you probably frustrate other people. What if that was true? Number one, shouldn't we work even harder to give one another grace? And two, shouldn't we be thankful for the opportunity to grow? What a great opportunity that is. We can actually step into it with a grateful expectancy that in the midst of this friction, God is going to do something that is going to be for my good and for his glory. That makes a beautiful story. Number three, 
threads are stronger together. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says it this way. It says, and if someone, over, if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. One person can be overpowered. Two can resist. And just you wait until we get three. It says one person can be overpowered. Two people, they've got something. They can resist. Do you add a third person into the mix? And all of a sudden... That's not, a, that's not something easily broken. That's something tight. You know, it's interesting. I've seen uh, over the last year, I've seen a marked increase in my personal evangelism life. Um, you know, it's funny. As a pastor, I talk about Jesus so much that sometimes it's very easy to forget that I have neighbors next to me, that I have friends that don't know Jesus, and that I still need to talk to them. I'm so busy talking about Jesus here that sometimes I forget that I've got those that I still have a personal faith outside of work to live out. You know, it's easy to let that slip. The difference over the last year is Caleb and I have had a ministry coach who asks us hard questions, who pushes us all the time. He asks, and he doesn't just ask me when I'm by myself. Hey, when was the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus? He asked me in front of Caleb. So now it's not just me, it's my youth pastor too that he's asking me in front of him and so all of a sudden I have to go, well, you know, I didn't really talk to anybody this week but it's it's been a busy week. I don't know. And then he returns the favor though for me and he asks Caleb the same question. So then then Caleb can go, well, I talked to, you know, he just starts lifting them off and I was like, oh man. But think about the impact that adding another person into the mix changes the dynamic. Having that extra person, you know, in the life groups that we've been a part of at HCC, I've seen the power of what happens when people in groups let one another in. When you're willing to be vulnerable and open and share and listen when other people share, it is amazing what begins to happen in there. You know, just as a sidebar, you can be around people and not in community. Um, I'm an expert in this. Um, Unless you choose to be vulnerable, Um, choose to share your needs, your hurts, your joys, you can stay isolated even in a group. Um, But when we let people in, and when we discover that it is safe to share our hearts in that group, there's the other side of that. We We have to discover that it's safe to do so. When we can say, this is my struggle, and we don't get rejected, when we don't get kind of pushed out when we get embraced, one can be overpowered. Two can resist. Three strands woven together, boy, watch out for the impact that can have. No story is a solo story. Every character overlaps. Threads are stronger together. And number four, um, you have the power of choice in this. You choose. You get to choose. I think one of the greatest lies we believe, when we're, especially when we're lonely, it's like the enemy knows exactly how to weave this lie into our minds when we're lonely, is this is what you have to be. This is what's been done to you. It's somebody else that made this happen. Or you just aren't worth it. All these kind of lies that come in and say, if you're lonely, this is who you have to be introverts in the room. Let me talk to you for a minute. Um, extroverts, you can listen if you want to. Um, if not, you know, doodle or, you know, something. Just don't be a distraction. Um, I speak to you, introverts, as one of you. Um, sometimes people are surprised by that because I stand up in front, but actually standing up in front and talking to a group of people is oftentimes easier for introverts um, than having conversation, than doing small talk with, like, ten people. Um, this is much. This is less draining, believe it or not, than that. Um, I get my energy from solitude. Um, if you've known me any length of time, you can see I, I'll tend to dodge out of small talk, or at the very least, I'm socially awkward during small talk because I don't know quite what to say, and so then I end up saying something weird. Um, yeah, and it, or a random movie quote will pop out, or something that's very strange will come out of me. It's like I don't know what I'm doing in those moments. So. I speak to you as one of you. 
I'm not comfortable introducing myself to new people. I get nervous in new groups where I'm not known. I get tired in crowds or even small groups easily, um, especially if I'm not with a couple of other people who make me feel safe. Man, high school was tough early on because I just didn't have anybody else. I was like, I don't know how to actually get into a group. So I was kind of one of those kids that kind of floated in between groups. Two things for us introverts. One, this still applies to you. It still applies to me. We don't get a pass on this because our energy comes from solitude. Be like, well, I'm an introvert, so it's okay. No, we still need community. And it's no one's responsibility but ours to choose to engage community. It's no one's responsibility besides ours. It's risk-taking venture, but it's one we have to do. Uh, number two, and this is part of the reason why it's so important that we do, is we have the opportunity to invite extroverts into a quieter, more contemplative space. Extroverts need us. And he's nodding. <laughs> She's like, yes, I do. <laughs> extroverts, if you're still with us, uh, let me talk to you real quick here. And I only pick on you if I love you. So, Introverts, you're already listening, so yeah, you know, what we do. Two things for you. One, you're probably like, I love community. Woo you're excited about this. You're like, finally, somebody's speaking truth. You know, that's my impression of extroverts. Like I said, I don't actually know what it looks like, um, and I need grace. But community is more than conversation. It's connection. It's connection. You may feel right at home in small talk, but intentionally getting into smaller groups and opening up might still be a challenge for you. And number two, you have an opportunity to invite introverts like me into a greater number of relationships and help us find community in the first place. You know, not too long ago, Monica and I were invited to a barbecue by some dear friends, and she is an extrovert extraordinaire, just makes friends wherever she goes. And they invited some other people to that barbecue, and that created an opportunity. Monica and I are one of those rare couples that are both introverts. They say that doesn't happen often because usually one person has to be willing to say hello. Uh, but somehow, through God's grace, we found each other. Um, she invited some others that created an opportunity for us to build a connection we would have never made any other way. And now we have some new friends that we've already found. Gosh, we have a lot in common. We have a lot of great connection with these folks. For all of us, we have a choice. We have a choice. Nothing is done to us. Doesn't mean, sorry, when I say that, I don't mean that nothing's ever done to you. But whatever is going on in your life, you still have a choice to make about whether or not you will engage. We have, and we also have an opportunity to help others who aren't wired the way we are. You know, as the worship team comes back up, I want to challenge you to take some steps this week. Um, and I'm also going to ask you to, uh, to come and help me with something that's fun and I think will be meaningful as well. Um, number one, if you aren't in a life group, I can't encourage you strongly enough to prioritize it. And we'll talk more about life groups in a couple weeks here, but um, you're never going to have enough time for a life group until you choose to make time for a life group. Um, that's just the bottom line of life. There's never enough time for things unless we choose that it matters enough to make time for it. Um, if you are in a life group, choose to be vulnerable. If your group feels surface level, instead of complaining about it, be the one who chooses to get open and vulnerable. It's amazing what happens when one person takes that step. It's like when one person stands up during worship, you tend to see the popcorn of other people jump up. Um, all it takes is one most of the time to begin to make things move. Be the one who takes a brave step and share. Number three, if you struggle to keep and make friends, be willing to do the hard work of self-examination. I've had to do this on numerous occasions to go, okay, why don't those people, like I me, mean, the old expression is that hurt people hurt people. The problem is, is when we're hurt, we tend to act hurtful and we tend to cut off the healing that could come if we would let people in. When I'm hurt, I know, I know my tendency 
when I'm hurt is to take offense, to get defensive, um, to try to prove my value in some way, shape, or form by knowing it all, because that's the way my brain is wired. But none of that helps me, and none of that helps anyone else. I have to get and look hard at myself and say, okay, if I'm, if I'm struggling to do with this, what do I need to do? What do I need to look at if I'm going to let people in here? It's so easy to just say this, you know, this is how it is, but the bottom line is, is you have agency. You have the power to make choices. You have the power to follow Jesus into meaningful relationships. You know, if you don't struggle this way, know that there are many who do. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, this is easy for me. I've got great community, great connection. I feel like I have meaningful friendships. Understand that there's a lot of people in the room who don't, which means you have another opportunity. You have the opportunity to help those people, to be the one who walks with them. That's what I got. The last part of my high school was a whole lot better than the first part because an extrovert who loved Jesus came alongside Invited me to go to church, invited me to, be, to hang out with his family, invited me to join him on the swim team despite the fact that I'm not athletic at all. I was like, hey, you should do this, you should do that. I was like, okay, okay. And all of a sudden I had a friend that opened up doors to other friends, that opened up doors to more growth. But see, ultimately, see, it's, it's all about choice. We have a choice of what we do with the relationships that are given us. And I guarantee you there is someone waiting for someone bold enough to ignore their, their bubble and the walls they put up and everything else and just stick their hand out and just shake their hand regardless of how they've been trained. See, because following, following Christ is not an easy life, and we weren't made to do it alone. So now for something a little bit fun. So those are some things to do, but I've got one more thing I want to ask of you this morning, but again, this is something I think is fun uh, more than anything else. You know, I pointed out the threads um, art earlier. Um, I, I put that one together on my own. I hammered some nails into a piece of wood and took a string and did a thing. Um, it's a picture, as a picture just to go with the sermon series, but, but the point isn't me doing something by myself. Um, the point is us doing things together, and so um, there's a second one that's up here laying on the stage, and I give you an overhead picture here um, of what that one looks like. Um, I want you to share in putting this one together. As you can see from that picture, because I just took it, there are threads all around um, that one. What I want you to do is following the service, you should come up and grab one of those threads, tie it to a nail, and then all you got to do is just move it back and forth randomly to other nails, just the, the, that tissue is in there to tell you where not to go, okay? The tissue is there to tell you where not to go, but I don't care whether you're a first-time visitor with us here, whether you've been here forever, you can, put, you can put your hand on this thing. I want as many hands as possible to be touching this thing, but just like us, the threads are different colors, different thicknesses, different styles, different in every, different lengths, because I'm terrible at cutting things into the same pattern. Fletcher is not happy about this. But just come up, take one, tie a little knot, loop it around, string it. When you get to about the end, just give it a few twirls and just put one more knot in it. We can tighten them up later, and I'll clip off the extras uh, when it's all said and done. Um, but just kind of run it around. There's, an there's one already on there, so you can see an example. And then what I want you to do is there's a little piece of paper on a clipboard. I want you to write your name on it. I'm going to tape that paper to the back of this thing when it's all said and done. And ultimately, these two together will be in the back over an area we're developing that gives opportunities, one, to get connected here in the body, two, to figure out where you can serve with the ministry here, and three, to help, uh, help us, something we'll talk about here in a few weeks, how we get involved and connected and woven into our community. So again, uh, oh, blessing. Parents, I want your kids' hands on this thing too, but they will need your help. So absolutely have your kid do it, have them write their name on it, walk them through that. Um, and also note that on one side, the wood is a little bit thinner, which means there are some nails coming out the back, so don't grab that side. You shouldn't need to grab it at all, but just as a note, again, help your kids. I'm not really worried about you, but 
help your kids as they go uh, do that. So do one today um, and then leave room because there are a lot of people who aren't here with us this morning and we'll ask them to do this next week and the week after and the week after and eventually we'll probably start asking you to do two um, to get this done because that's several hundred feet of thread that need to get wound up on there. Um, but we, we are one church, but we're many threads. We're threads that don't look alike, think alike, act alike, but we are threads woven together for God's purposes and God's timing. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I just ask that we would recognize the important role we play in the lives of one another. God, that we would not that we would not think that we can isolate ourselves, that we can remain separated, that our decisions don't impact other people. God, but that we've been called, part of the reason we've been called to grow in our discipleship, to become more like Jesus, is because we do have an impact on people, for better or for worse. And so you call us to love. You call us to look more like you, to walk like you, to, to become threads in your hand. Lord, we ask for you to just shape us this morning. Bind us together in new and meaningful ways. Help us to get vulnerable. Help us to get open. Help us to soften to one another. Or that we may truly be a church that is not just a pile of, of unattached threads, but a church that is woven together into one beautiful picture by your hand. We thank you for all you're doing. We thank you for all you are. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, on the cross. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.